Voltaire. François Marie Arouet, better known by the name of Voltaire, was born at Chateauneuf on the twentieth of February, sixteen ninety four. By assuming the name of Voltaire, young Arouet followed the custom, at the time generally practiced by the rich citizens and younger sons, who, leaving the family name to the heir, assumed that of a fief, or perhaps of a country house. The father of M. de Voltaire was treasurer to the Chamber of Accounts, and his mother, Margaret Daumont, was of a noble family of Poitou. The fortune which the father enjoyed, enabling him to bestow a first-class education upon the young Arouet, who was sent to the Jesuits' college, where the sons of the nobility received their education. While at school, Voltaire began to write poetry, and gave signs of a remarkable genius. His tutors, Father Poré and Jay, from the boldness and independence of his mind, predicted that he would become the apostle of deism in France. This prediction he fulfilled. Voltaire was, says Lord Brougham, through his whole life a sincere believer in the existence and attributes of the deity. He was firm and decided, and an openly declared unbeliever in Christianity. But he was, without any hesitation or any intermission, a theist. His open declaration of disbelief in the inspiration of the Bible, and his total rejection of the dogmas of Christianity, laid him open to the malignant attacks and misrepresentations of the priesthood and the bigots of Europe, and so strong were they that his life was continually in danger. Lord Brougham, in his Men of Letters of the time of George the Third, says, Voltaire's name is so intimately connected in the minds of all men with infidelity, in the minds of most men with irreligion, and in the minds of all who are not well informed with these qualities alone, that whoever undertakes to write his life and examine his claim to the vast reputation which all the hostile feelings excited by him against himself have never been able to destroy, or even materially to impair, has to labor under a great load of prejudice, and can hardly expect, by any detail of particulars, to obtain for his subject even common justice at the hands of the general reader. Voltaire was born in a corrupt age, and in a capital where it was fashionable to be immoral. When he left college, he was introduced by his own godfather, the Abbe de Chateauneuf, to the notorious Ninon de L'Enclos, who, at her death, left him by will two thousand livres to purchase books. In estimating the character of Voltaire, a due consideration must be had for the period in which he lived, and of the nature of the society amidst which he was reared. He lived twenty years under the reign of Louis the Fourteenth, and during the whole of the reign of the infamous Louis the Fifteenth when kings courtiers and priests set the example of the grossest immorality it was then as voltaire said that to make the smallest fortune it was better to say four words to the mistress of a king than to write a hundred volumes voltaire's life from his youth upwards was a stormy one after he left college, his father, finding him persisting in writing poetry and living at large, forbade him in his house. He insisted upon his son binding himself to an attorney, but his restless disposition quite unfitted him for regular employment, and he soon quitted the profession. He early made the acquaintance of the most celebrated men of his time, but his genius, his wit, and his sarcasm soon raised up numerous enemies. At the age of twenty-two he was accused of having written a satire upon Louis the Fourteenth, who was just dead, and was thrown into the Bastille. But he was not cast down. It was here that he sketched his poem of the League, corrected his tragedy of Oedipus, and wrote some merry verses on the misfortune of being a prisoner. The regent, Duke of Orléans, being informed of his innocence, restored him to freedom, and granted him a recompense. "'I thank your royal highness,' said Voltaire, "'for having provided me with food, but I hope you will not hereafter trouble yourself concerning my lodging.' voltaire with his activity of mind and living to so great an age must necessarily produce many works 
they are voluminous consisting of history poetry and philosophy his dramatic pieces are numerous many of which are considered second only to shakespeare's oedipus zadik ingenue zaire henriade irene tancred mahomet merope saul azire le fanatisme mariamne gaston de foix enfant projet pucelle d'orleans an essay on fire the elements history of charles twelfth lectures on man letters on england memoirs voyage of the sacramentado micromegas maid of orleans brutus adelaide death of caesar temple of taste essay on the manners and spirit of nations an examination of the holy scriptures and the philosophical dictionary are works that emanated from the active brain of this wit poet satirist and philosopher in seventeen twenty two while at brussels voltaire met jean baptiste rousseau whose misfortunes he deplored and whose poetic talents he esteemed voltaire read some of his poems to rousseau and he in return read to voltaire his ode addressed to posterity which voltaire it is asserted told him would never arrive at the place to which it was addressed the two poets parted irreconcilable foes in seventeen twenty five voltaire was again shut up in the bastille through attempting to revenge an insult inflicted upon him by a courtier at the end of six months he was released but ordered to quit paris he sought refuge in england in seventeen twenty six he was the guest in that country of a mr falconer of wandsworth whose hospitality he remembered with affection so long as life lasted voltaire was known to most of the wits and free thinkers of that day in england at this early age he was at war with christianity his visit to england says lamartine gave assurance and gravity to his incredulity for in france he had only known libertines in england he knew philosophers he went to visit congreve who had the affectation to tell him that he congreve valued himself not on his authorship but as a man of the world to which voltaire administered a just rebuke by saying i should never have come so far to see a gentleman voltaire soon acquired an ample fortune much of which was expended in aiding men of letters and in encouraging such youth as he thought discovered the seeds of genius the use he made of riches might prevail on envy itself to pardon him their acquirement his pen and his purse were ever at the service of the oppressed calas an infirm old man living at toulouse was accused of having hung his son to prevent his becoming a catholic the catholic population became inflamed and the young man was declared to be a martyr the father was condemned to the torture and the wheel and died protesting his innocence the family of calas was ruined and disgraced voltaire assuring himself of the innocence of the old man determined to obtain justice for the family to this end he labored incessantly for three years in all this time he said a smile did not escape him for which he did not reproach himself as for a crime his efforts were successful nor was this the only cause in which he was engaged on the side of the weak and the wronged against the powerful and the persecuting his whole life though maligned as an infidel and a scoffer was one long act of benevolence on learning that a young niece of corneille languished in a condition unworthy of his name voltaire in the most delicate manner invited her to his house and she there received an education suitable to the rank that her birth had marked for her in society it is the duty of a soldier he said to succor the niece of his general voltaire lived for a time at the court of frederick the great of prussia and for many years carried on a correspondence with that monarch he quarrelled with the king and left the court in a passion an emissary was dispatched to him to request an apology who said he was to carry back to the king his answer verbatim voltaire told him that the king might go to the devil on being asked if that was the message he meant to be delivered 
Yes, he answered, and add to it that I told you that you might go there with him. In his memoirs he has drawn a most amusing picture of his Prussian majesty. He also says, Priests never entered the palace, and in a word Frederick lived without religion, without a council, and without a court. Wearied with his rambling and unsettled mode of living, Voltaire bought an estate at Fernay in the Pays de Gay, where he spent the last twenty years of his life. He rebuilt the house, laid out gardens, kept a good table, and had crowds of visitors from all parts of Europe. Removed from whatever could excite momentary or personal passion, he yielded to his zeal for the destruction of prejudice, which was the most powerful and active of all the sensations he felt. This peaceful life, seldom disturbed except by the threats of persecution, rather than persecution itself, was adorned by those acts of enlightened and bold benevolence, which, while they relieve the sufferings of certain individuals, are of any service to the whole human race. He was known to Europe as the Sage of Fernay. After an absence of more than twenty-seven years, he revisited Paris at the beginning of 1778. He had just finished his play of Irene, and was anxious to see it performed. His visit was an ovation. He had outlived all his enemies. After having been the object of unrelenting persecution by the priests and corrupt courtiers of France for a period of more than fifty years, he yet lived to see the day when all that was the most eminent in station or most distinguished in talents, all that most shone in society or most ruled in court, seemed to bend before him. At this period he, for the first time, saw Benjamin Franklin. They embraced each other in the midst of public acclamations, and it was said to be Solon who embraced Sophocles. Voltaire did not survive his triumph long. His unwearied activity induced him, at his great age, to commence a dictionary upon a novel plan, which he prevailed upon the French Academy to take up. These labors brought on spitting of blood followed by sleeplessness, to obviate which he took opium in considerable quantities. Condorcet says that the servant mistook one of the doses which threw him into a state of lethargy from which he never rallied. He lingered for some time, but at length expired on the 30th of May, 1778, in his eighty-fifth year. It was the custom in those days, and prevails to a considerable extent even in our own time, for the religious world to fabricate horrible deathbeds of all freethinkers. Voltaire's last moments were distorted by his enemies after the approved fashion, and notwithstanding the most unqualified denial on the part of Dr. Burard and others, who were present at his death, there are many who believe these falsehoods at this moment. Voltaire died in peace, with the exception of the petty annoyances to which he was subjected by the priests. The philosophers, too, who wished that no public stigma should be cast upon him by the refusal of Christian burial, persuaded him to undergo confession and absolution. This, to oblige his friends, he submitted to. But when the cure one day drew him from his lethargy, by shouting into his ear, do you believe the divinity of Jesus Christ? Voltaire exclaimed, In the name of God, sir, speak to me no more of that man, but let me die in peace. This put to flight all doubts of the pious, and the certificate of burial was refused. But the prohibition of the Bishop of Troyes came too late. Voltaire was buried at the monastery of Celieres in Champagne, of which his nephew was abbot. Afterwards, during the first French Revolution, the body, at the request of the citizens, was removed to Paris, and buried in the Pantheon. Lamartine, in his History of the Girondists, page 149, speaking of the ceremony, says, On the 11th of July the departmental and municipal authorities went in state to the barrier of Charenton to receive the mortal remains of Voltaire, 
which were placed on the ancient site of the bastille like a conqueror on his trophies his coffin was exposed to public gaze and a pedestal was formed for it of stones torn from the foundations of this ancient stronghold of tyranny and thus voltaire when dead triumphed over those stones which had triumphed over and confined him when living on one of the blocks was the inscription receive on this spot where despotism once fettered thee the honours decreed to thee by thy country the coffin of voltaire was deposited between those of descartes and mirabeau the spot predestined for this intermediary genius between philosophy and policy between the design and the execution the aim of voltaire's life was the destruction of prejudice and the establishment of reason deists said w j fox in eighteen nineteen have done much for toleration and religious liberty it may be doubted if there be a country in europe where that cause has not been advanced by the writings of voltaire in the preface and conclusion to the examination of the scriptures voltaire says the ambition of domineering over the mind is one of the strongest passions a theologian a missionary or a partisan of any description is always for conquering like a prince and there are many more sects than there are sovereigns in the world to whose guidance shall i submit my mind must i be a christian because i happened to be born in london or in madrid must i be a mussulman because i was born in turkey as it is myself alone that i ought to consult the choice of a religion is my greatest interest one man adores god by mahomet another by the grand lama another by the pope weak and foolish men adore god by your own reason i have learnt that a french vicar by the name of john messier who died a short time since prayed on his deathbed that god would forgive him for having taught christianity I have seen a vicar in Dorsetshire relinquish a living of two hundred pounds a year, and confess to his parishioners that his conscience would not permit him to preach the shocking absurdities of the Christians. But neither the will nor the testament of John Meslier, nor the declaration of this worthy vicar, are what I consider decisive proofs uriel acosta a jew publicly renounced the old testament in amsterdam however i pay no more attention to the jew acosta than to parson meslier i will read the arguments on both sides of the trial with careful attention not suffering the lawyers to tamper with me but will weigh before god the reasons of both parties and decide according to my conscience i commence by being my own instructor i conclude that every sensible man every honest man ought to hold christianity in abhorrence the great name of theist which we can never sufficiently revere is the only name we ought to adopt the only gospel we should read is the grand book of nature written with god's own hand and stamped with his own seal the only religion we ought to profess is to adore god and act like honest men it would be as impossible for this simple and eternal religion to produce evil as it would be impossible for christian fanaticism not to produce it but what shall we substitute in its place say you what a ferocious animal has sucked the blood of my relatives i tell you to rid yourselves of this beast and you ask me what you shall put in its place is it you that put this question to me then you are a hundred times more odious than the pagan pontiffs who permitted themselves to enjoy tranquillity among their ceremonies and sacrifices who did not attempt to enslave the mind by dogmas who never disputed the powers of the magistrates and who introduced no discord among mankind you have the face to ask what you must substitute in the place of your fables as will be seen by his exclamation on his deathbed voltaire was no believer in the divinity of christ he disbelieved the bible in toto the accounts of the doings of the jewish kings as represented in the old testament he has unsparingly ridiculed in the drama of saul 
the quiet irony of the following will be easily appreciated divinity of jesus the socinians who are regarded as blasphemers do not recognize the divinity of jesus christ they dare to pretend with the philosophers of antiquity with the jews the mahometans and most other nations that the idea of a god man is monstrous that the distance from god to man is infinite and that it is impossible for a perishable body to be infinite immense or eternal they have the confidence to quote Eusebius, Bishop of Caesarea, in their favor, who in his Ecclesiastical History, Book 1, Chapter 9, declares that it is absurd to imagine the uncreated and unchangeable nature of Almighty God taking the form of man. They cite the fathers of the church, Justin and Tertullian, who have said the same thing, Justin in his dialogue with Trophonius, and Tertullian in his discourse against Praxius they quote st paul who never calls jesus christ god and who calls him man very often they carry their audacity so far as to affirm that the christians passed three entire ages in forming by degrees the apotheosis of jesus and that they only raised this astonishing edifice by the example of the pagans who had deified mortals at first according to them jesus was only regarded as a man inspired by god and then as a creature more perfect than others they gave him some time after a place above the angels as st paul tells us every day added to his greatness he in time became an emanation proceeding from god this was not enough he was even born before time at last he was god consubstantial with god crelius vocelsius natalus alexander and hornbeck have supported all these blasphemies by arguments which astonish the wise and mislead the weak above all faustus socinus spread the seeds of this doctrine in europe and at the end of the sixteenth century a new species of christianity was established there were already more than three hundred philosophical dictionary volume one page four o five though a firm and consistent believer in the being of a god voltaire was no bigot the calm reasoning of the following passage does honor to its author faith divine faith about which so much has been written is evidently nothing more than incredulity brought under subjection for we certainly have no other faculty than the understanding by which we can believe and the objects of faith are not those of the understanding we can believe only what appears to be true and nothing can appear true but in one of the three following ways by intuition or feeling as i exist i see the sun or by an accumulation of probability amounting to certainty as there is a city called constantinople or by positive demonstration as triangles of the same base and height are equal faith therefore being nothing at all of this description can no more be a belief a persuasion than it can be yellow or red it can be nothing but the annihilation of reason a silence of adoration at the contemplation of things absolutely incomprehensible thus speaking philosophically no person believes the trinity no person believes that the same body can be in a thousand places at once and he who says i believe these mysteries will see beyond the possibility of a doubt if he reflects for a moment on what passes in his mind that these words mean no more than i respect the mysteries i submit myself to those who announce them for they agree with me that my real reason their own reason believe them not but it is clear if my reason is not persuaded i am not persuaded and my reason cannot possibly be two different things it is an absolute contradiction that i should receive that as true which my understanding rejects as false faith therefore is nothing but submissive or deferential incredulity but why should this submission be exercised when my understanding invincibly recoils the reason we well know is that my understanding has been persuaded that the mysteries of my faith are laid down by god himself 
all then that i can do as a reasonable being is to be silent and adore that is what divines call external faith and this faith neither is nor can be anything more than respect for things incomprehensible in consequence of the reliance i place on those who teach them if god himself were to say to me thought is of an olive color the square of a certain number is bitter i should certainly understand nothing at all from these words i could not adopt them either as true or false but i will repeat them if he commands me to do it and i will make others repeat them at the risk of my life this is faith it is nothing more than obedience in order to obtain a foundation then for this obedience it is merely necessary to examine the books which require it our understanding therefore should investigate the books of the old and new testament just as it would plutarch or livy and if it finds in them incontestable and decisive evidences evidences obvious to all minds and such as would be admitted by men of all nations that god himself is their author then it is our incumbent duty to subject our understanding to the yoke of faith prayer we know of no religion without prayers even the jews had them although there was no public form of prayer among them before the time when they sang their canticles in their synagogues which did not take place until a late period the people of all nations whether actuated by desires or fears have summoned the assistance of the divinity philosophers however more respectful to the supreme being and rising more above human weakness have been habituated to substitute for prayer resignation this in fact is all that appears proper and suitable between creature and creator but philosophy is not adapted to the great mass of mankind it soars too highly above the vulgar it speaks a language they are unable to comprehend to propose philosophy to them would be just as weak as to propose the study of conic sections to peasants or fishwomen among philosophers themselves i know of no one besides maximus tyrius who has treated of this subject the following is the substance of his ideas upon it the designs of god exist from all eternity if the object prayed for be conformable to his immutable will it must be perfectly useless to request of him the very thing which he has determined to do if he is prayed to for the reverse of what he has determined to do he is prayed to be weak fickle and inconstant such a prayer implies that this is thought to be his character and is nothing better than ridicule or mockery of him you either request of him what is just and right in which case he ought to do it and it will be actually done without any solicitation which in fact shows distrust of his rectitude or what you request is unjust and then you insult him you are either worthy or unworthy of the favor you implore if worthy he knows it better than you do yourself if unworthy you commit an additional crime in requesting that which you do not merit in a word we offer up prayers to god only because we have made him after our own image we treat him like a pasha or a sultan who is capable of being exasperated and appeased in short all nations pray to god the sage is resigned and obeys him let us pray with the people and let us be resigned to him with the sage we have already spoken of the public prayer of many nations and of those of the jews that people have had one from time immemorial which deserves all our attention from its resemblance to the prayer taught us by jesus christ himself this jewish prayer is called the kaddish and begins with these words oh god let thy name be magnified and sanctified make thy kingdom to prevail let redemption flourish and the messiah come quickly as this kaddish is recited in chaldee it has induced the believer that it is as ancient as the captivity and that it was at that period that the jews began to hope for a messiah a liberator or redeemer whom they have since prayed for in the seasons of their calamities voltaire's contempt for the bible led him to use the language of holy writ in the coarsest jokes 
although perhaps with such material the jokes could not well be otherwise than coarse the following letter he addressed to m bayon intendant of lyons on account of a poor jew taken up for uttering contraband goods this kind of writing obtained for voltaire the title of scoffer blessings on the old testament which gives me this opportunity of telling you that amongst all those who adore the new there is not one more devoted to your service than myself a certain descendant of jacob a peddler as all these gentlemen are whilst he is waiting for the messiah waits also for your protection which at present he has the most need of some honest men of the first trade of st matthew who gather together the jews and christians at the gates of your city have seized something in the breeches pocket of an israelitish page belonging to the poor circumcised who has the honor to tender you this billet with all proper submission and humility i beg you leave to join my amen to his at a venture i but just saw you at paris as moses saw the deity and should be very happy in seeing you face to face if the word face can any ways be applied to me preserve some remembrance of your old eternal humble servant who loves you with that chaste and tender affection which the religious solomon had for his three hundred shuhamites voltaire's prodigious wit and sarcasm were so exuberant that he expended them upon all people and all subjects even himself when occasion admitted of it in one of his letters addressed to the elector palatine september ninth seventeen sixty one he gives this excuse for not attending at the court i should really make an excellent figure amidst the rejoicings of your electoral highness it was only i think in the egypt of antiquity that skeletons were admitted to a place in their festivals to say the truth my lord it is all over with me i laugh indeed sometimes but i am forced to acknowledge that pain is an evil it is a comfort to me that your highness is well but i am fitter for an extreme unction than a baptism may the peace serve for an era to mark the prince's birth and may his august father preserve his regard for and accept the profound respects of his little swiss voltaire in politics voltaire was not very far advanced he seems to have had no idea of a nation without a king a monarch who should not commit any very flagrant acts of tyranny was as much as he appeared to desire he evidently did not foresee the great revolution that was so soon to burst forth in france but that he mainly contributed by his writings to bring it about there can be no doubt his influence upon the men of his time both in france and europe is ably depicted by such writers as lamartine quinet and brougham voltaire's was the one great mind of his day whose thoughts engrossed the attention of all men he was great by his learning his genius and his benevolence and this man was the champion of reason the enemy of superstition and an infidel quinet in his lectures on the romish church says i watch for forty years the reign of one man who is in himself the spiritual director not of his country but of his age from the corner of his chamber he governs the kingdom of spirits intellects are every day regulated by his one word written by his hand traverses europe princes love and kings fear him they think they are not sure of their kingdom if he be not with them whole nations on their side adopt without discussion and emulously repeat every syllable that falls from his pen who exercises this incredible power which had been nowhere seen since the middle ages is he another gregory the second is he a pope no voltaire we conclude our little sketch with the eloquent words of lamartine who describes in a few sentences the inestimable services rendered to free thought and intellectual progression by the sage of fernet if we judge of men by what they have done then voltaire is incontestably the greatest writer of modern europe no one has caused through the powerful influence of his genius alone and the perseverance of his will so great a commotion in the minds of men his pen aroused a world and has shaken a far mightier empire than that of charlemagne the european empire of a theocracy 
his genius was not force but light heaven had destined him not to destroy but to illuminate and wherever he trod light followed him for reason which is light had destined him to be first her poet then her apostle and lastly her idol 